The Kaiser Wilhelm Society flies the swastika, uses Heil Hitler in its correspondence, praises the Reich in its reports, accepts Nazi policy in most matters and compromises on the rest. Planck and Hahn welcome the increased funding for military research at the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. They did not share all the conventions of the Nazi politicians, but due to their nationalistic ideology, uh, they agreed that the German scientists should foster uh, research uh, to bring forward a strong German army. They served the Nazi government as good as any uh, convinced Nazi did, sometimes even better in a way because they were more um, accepted abroad. In April 1933, the law for the restoration of the professional civil service expelling all Jews from public service is enacted. The Kaiser Wilhelm Society is a private organization. The general administration of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society accepted the Nazi laws uh, concerning the so-called restoration of the professional civil service, which meant that they agreed to fire their Jewish scientists, although this law was made for state-funded institutes. If all German scientists would have had protested in 1933 when the Jewish scientists were kicked out, this would have had a very big effect, but they didn't. The Kaiser Wilhelm Society dismisses all its Jewish scientists, except for a few of its most prominent non-Aryans. One of those non-Aryans is Lisa Meitner. Meitner is ready to consider emigration. Indeed, Niels Bohr, the physicist and Nobel laureate, offers her a grant to work at his institute in Copenhagen. She hears Planck advise a Jewish colleague, take a short vacation abroad, and when you return, all the unpleasantness will be gone. And that is what Lisa wanted to hear. I built my physics section from its first little stone. It was, so to speak, my life's work, and it seemed terribly hard for me to separate myself from it. Lisa Meitner had created for herself in Berlin a substitute for a family. She had crafted a world, a community, that could sustain her. She had created a life for herself with the, all of the emotional and social support that was necessary. And she must have known how special that was. In 1932, a year before Hitler comes to power, James Chadwick discovers the neutron, a subatomic particle with no charge. It revolutionizes scientists' understanding of the nucleus. Lisa is engrossed in these newest findings. One can certainly say that a large part of the reputation of our institute, especially abroad, rested on the work that was done in the Meitner section. Meitner decides to stay. She knows she can't find a better place to work than in her own laboratory in Berlin. But her professional activities outside the Institute are over. She is dismissed from her teaching position at the University of Berlin, no longer invited to attend conferences or deliver papers. High-level scientists put science and their own work above everything. And in this case, under the National Socialists, there is no question that both Otto Hahn and Lisa Meitner thought that it was worthwhile to keep doing science no matter what. She was contributing to German prestige by her work. There's no, there's no getting around that. By staying for five years, by continuing to do good work, it could be interpreted both inside of Germany and outside of Germany that Nazism was somehow tolerable and that in particular a Jewish person could survive under the Nazis. Today it is clear to me that I committed a great moral wrong by not leaving in 33 because staying had the result of supporting Hitlerism. Hahn is anti-Nazi, but he too places his science above all else. They were protecting their institute and themselves 
by being complicit with the National Socialist rules and regulations. In the next four years, under the malignant eye of the Nazis, Meitner and Hahn will collaborate on research that will lead to their most significant discovery. It begins in 1934 in Rome. Enrico Fermi bombards uranium nuclei with neutrons. So this really opened up an entire new field of nuclear physics with many new substances and reactions that had not been possible before. Now, Lisa Meitner followed these experiments of Enrico Fermi's very closely. Fermi was in Rome, she was in Berlin, she had all the equipment, she could duplicate what he was doing without any trouble. And she was very interested in these new results because it was exactly in her field of expertise. Fermi and his group report that they have found new radioactive substances that seem different from all known elements. And so Fermi very cautiously suggested that these new activities might be elements beyond uranium. Scientists, including Meitner, are fascinated. It's been many years since she and Hahn worked together. Lisa decides to recruit him to investigate the possibility of new elements beyond uranium. It was clear to me that one could not get ahead in this field with physics alone. The help of an outstanding chemist like Otto was needed to get results. Together, they ask Fritz Strassmann, a young chemist in the Institute and strong anti-Nazi, to join them. Meitner begins her own experiments, establishing the Uranium Project in Berlin. She and the chemists, Hahn and Strassmann, are heading into uncharted territory. They believe they are creating elements beyond uranium. They imagine that the uranium nucleus absorbs a neutron and then radioactively decays into a new element, 93, which in turn decays into still another new element, 94, and so on. But in Berlin and elsewhere, scientists are misled by two wrong assumptions. Nuclear physicists believe that nuclear changes must always be small. They never imagine a drastic disintegration of the uranium nucleus. The chemists assume that elements 93, 94, and beyond have certain chemical properties which they do not. The Berlin team pursues the elusive new elements for four years, but in 1938, Meitner's time in Germany comes to an abrupt end. On March 12, 1938, German troops march over the border into Austria and not a shot is fired. Colossal crowds deliriously cheer Hitler. He addresses them as German racial comrades. Austrians are now German citizens. Now at this point, Lisa Meitner was no longer protected by her Austrian citizenship. She had an Austrian passport, it was invalid, and she had none of the protections that she had had up till that point. Her status in the Institute became very questionable. There were people who whispered, the Jewess endangers the Institute. Indeed, all Jews are in danger. Meitner stays close to her laboratory. Hans acutely aware of the dangers to Lisa and to his Institute. What to do about Lisa? She must leave the Institute, the authorities tell him, now. Han says I should not come to the Institute anymore. He has, in essence, thrown me out. At age 59, Meitner is facing the unknown. Nonetheless, she keeps working. If she leaves, where would she go? Where could she work? Emigration requires preparation, contacts, letters and visas. Again, Niels Bohr invites her to Copenhagen. Other offers come in from around the world. But without a valid passport, she can go nowhere. Deeply worried, Lisa meets with the new president of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, Karl Bosch. He writes to Wilhelm Frick at the German Ministry of the Interior, asking that Meitner be issued a German passport. 20th May, 1938. I've concerned myself with an assignment which, in our opinion, only you can decide. It concerns Frau Professor Meitner, 
who works scientifically in the KWI for chemistry. Frau Meitner is prepared to leave at any time to assume a scientific position in another country. It is only a question of obtaining a German passport. I would be very grateful if you could put me in the position of settling this matter. Heil Hitler.